Hello everybody, welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. Delighted that you have stopped by. This is all about wine education, enjoying, understanding wine to enjoy it better. We are here looking at Spain and we are actually in Castilla Leon for this part. Now, this uh, uh, series is actually labelled Bierzo, but uh, in fact, we will have an introduction to the whole region of Castilla Leon in this first video. So that's why the uh, wonderful city of Segovia, which is actually just north of Madrid, south of places like Valladolid, for example, uh, is on this picture. Some of those beautiful Roman aqueducts uh, and probably the most majestic and largest example still standing today in Western Europe. So yes, we are here looking at Castilla Leon. We are here in Bierzo for this first, uh, the first series. Castilla Leon is actually split into five series. You'll see here, Bierzo, Ribera del Duero, Rueda, Toro, and the other parts, the other wine parts of the region. And here on this Bierzo section, four parts, and we're going to do the introduction to Castilla Leon. Uh, part two, we'll be looking at the introduction to Bierzo, its history, climate, and grape growing. And then we'll go into part three on Mencia, and then the Dio itself for Bierzo. So let's uh, get some geography under our belt. Let's have a look at the location of this area to begin with. So the autonomous community of Castilla Leon covers a, a very vast area in North Spain. It's actually one fifth of mainland Spain. It is the largest region in Spain and the third largest region in the European Union. Uh, it's made up of a high altitude plateau, which is the northern part of the Mazetta, with mountains to the north, uh, which is the Cantabrian mountains. And then we have mountains to the south as well. Uh, so things that are separated to Madrid, uh, and that is things like the um, Sierra Guadalama, for example, and Gredos uh, in that area. So it is uh, hemmed in, in this pl raised plateau between two mountains in the northern part of Spain. So with this element of centrality in this raised plateau away from the coast and protected by mountains, uh, many of the parts of Castilla Leon are continental. Um, there are little changes in certain places and we will go through those of course. Uh, of course when we look at our first area in this series uh, which is Bierzo, that's the one that actually is, is located over here and has an influence that comes from the Atlantic. Uh, now, we have a huge amount of DOs here. There are a number of internationally recognized DOs. Um, and the whole region actually has a Vina de la Tierra, which is Castilla Leon. Uh, so VT Castilla Leon as well, but a number of very important DOs here as well. Um, the history of this area. So first of all, this aligns a little bit to the series when we looked at the introduction to Spain, but more pertinent, more specific to Castilla and Leon, of course. Now, Celtic tribes were here occupying the northern parts, along with the Vasios, Asturias and the Celtiberians. Uh, so the northern areas, certainly that border the other autonomous provinces today. Uh, the Greeks. Now we have documentation from the Greeks writing about the cultivation of vines of the Vaceo tribe or Vaceo tribe. Uh, and this was the area in the Duero Basin. Uh, and this is called Burgidium. Burgidinium, I suppose it is called. My Latin uh, is not the strongest. It's a long time ago since I uh, actually spoke <laughs> Latin, many decades. Uh, so, uh, Burgidium, I suppose it would be said. And today, this is Bierzo, the area called, called Bierzo, uh, the same sort of uh, location. Uh, next up, so Romans invading in 153 BC. Uh, we actually have here a, um, a picture of Numancia, which is in the Soria province, which is towards the far easterly point of Castilla Leon, uh, just south of La Rioja, uh, really where you are close to the, um, the, the emerging point of the Duero River as uh, the source point of the Duero River. 
Uh, and this area, now the Celtiberian tribe, burned the city instead of surrendering to the rampaging Romans, of course. But the notable achievements of the Romans here would be the Segovian aqueduct that we had on the first picture, uh, trade, increasing it across the whole peninsula, in fact, and also agricultural techniques and, of course, engineering uh, like uh, bridges and so on. Here is Segovia once again. Of course, this is in the southern section of Castilla y Leon on the border uh, of Madrid, uh, close towards Madrid. A beautiful place to go and visit for um, a couple of reasons, really. You have the Alcazar here, which is a castle reminiscent of a castle of Walt Disney. And then you have the Segovian aqueduct as well, uh, with the town sitting um, on this right hand side. So you'll see here, um, uh, you, you will approach Segovia normally from um, the north, which is this area up here. And then the pedestrianized area is to the right hand side of this picture. Wonderful restaurants here. This one is uh, one that you have to book well in advance to get into. I cannot remember the name, however. Um, so <laughs> a little bit more, and I've got some more famous landmarks for you as well. But, but now we're going to talk about the uh, what we would call the, the Christian reconquest. Now, we just mentioned Celt tribes, and then we've mentioned the Roman influence. Uh, after the collapse of the Roman Empire came the Visigoths, and after the Visigoths, uh, well, really, the Visigoths were wiped out by the Moors, of course, who um, started to invade from the southern parts of Spain, through Andalusia, and conquered most of the Iberian Peninsula within about 10 to 15 years. Uh, and the land above Castilla León, which is areas like Galicia, Asturias, Cantabria, uh, the Pais Vasco, all these areas were not dominated by the Moors, and it left a small ember of the Christians within uh, the Iberian Peninsula. And of course, they used this as a staging point to start the Reconquista. And the Christian reconquest for León and Castile so these are two very large kingdoms, which eventually, of course, combine. Uh, under Alfonso IX, the Basilica of San Isidoro was the first seat of parliament, the parliamentary body. Uh, the Moorish expulsion of the Castile Leon area was finally uh, finished in the 13th century. And of course, with the rest of the Iberian Peninsula being free of the Moors by the 15th century, we then start to see Spain going into its golden age. And of course, we have for many centuries royalty, wealth, education and wine, artists, culture, um, explorers, you name it. Of course, uh, Spain fiercely goes into its golden age. Any comments, uh, any questions? Maybe you visited Castilla y Leon. Maybe you've been to Bieso. Maybe you've tried the wines of the region. Please let me know about it in the comment section below this video. Make sure you also click like and subscribe whilst you are down there. Um, some of the uh, key landmarks to come out of the Golden Age. Here we have a castle situated uh, to the east of Valladolid. Uh, to uh, very close to Arando del Duero. And this is the Peñafiel Castle, as you can see here. Uh, lovely to go and visit. It's a winding road up the top of it uh, and has a museum uh, situated inside as well. Um, in the sort of northeast of the province of Castilla y Leon, towards, uh, let's say, Santander, uh, towards Bilbao and close to La Rioja, is the city of Burgos, very famous for its extravagant and well-detailed cathedral that you see just here. Also, really the birthplace, the home of Morcia as well, which is your wonderful uh, um, sort of blood sausage, blood orange, uh, blood sausage. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, Segovia, that's the Alcazar again. Now we uh, talked about the uh, the aqueduct, because this is the Alcazar, it's got a gorgeous cathedral here too in the background that you can see. And also towards the uh, more westerly point of the province, there is Avilia as you head uh, sort of towards Portugal, which is well worth seeing. Uh, Avilia is gorgeous. It dates back to the end of the 11th century. 
uh, and it was built to defend the town's population against the threat of Moorish armies. Uh, it stretches for about one and a half miles with 80 towers and nine gates. It's very, very impeding, as one can see. Now, more of the history. So the Duero Valley was colonised quite uh, increasingly, in part due to the Camino de Santiago, the Way of St. James. As you can see here, the red line that comes from France then ends up through Navarra, through La Rioja, and then through all of that large, expansive area of Castilla y Leon as you go through Burgos, you go through Lyon, and then you head through Bieso into Galicia. This is the Camino de Santiago. So, of course, lots of villages and towns emerged and then expanded off the amount of tourism, really. But, uh, of course, lots of expertise, lots of travellers and religious uh, influence, money and wealth and power that would come off the back of this. Uh, so, yeah, increased amount of monasteries along this Camino de Santiago. Around monasteries, inevitably, vineyards spring up, of course, because wine was used for sacramental purposes. So you've got vineyards spreading along all of this Camino de Santiago. So prosperity, of course. More history of the autonomous region in the 15th century. Um, not Bieso, which we'll look at in later videos in this series, but Toro, Toro, which sits uh, at still quite a high altitude, but one of the lower parts of the Duero River as it meanders its way to the west. Uh, so you have Ribera del Duero, places like Rueda, and then Toro. And uh, you find actually Toro wine on the manifest for the Pinta, which was the Columbus ship, the fast ship of Columbus. So wine, of course, therefore, becoming quite famous from this area across the Spanish Empire. Uh, you also have Tierra de Medina, which comes from Rueda, which is next door to Toro, prized by Queen Isabella of the Isabella and Ferdinand combination, and in fact, there were enacted um, regulations to protect the vineyards of Rueda with this Tierra de Medina. And finally, we come up to more modern times. So Phylloxera sort of hits France, of course, in the 1860s. Castilla y Leon is one of those northern parts of Spain called upon to supply the areas like France with wine, as there was, of course, a huge huge deficit in wine production in France. Uh, we had uh, Toro, Sigales, Ribera del Duero and Rueda areas really being at the forefront of supplying that deficit into France. And of course, along with other autonomous provinces, uh, areas like Navarra, uh, areas like Aragon and also Catalonia, for example. Uh, so we also know that phylloxera uh, hasn't affected some parts of Castilla y Leon, specifically in areas where you have this soil you see here. So some of the sandy soils that one finds in areas like Toro and Rueda, you will find often uh, pre-phylloxera or ungrafted uh, vines in this area, uh, as one can see just here. OK, so that is my briefer introduction there to Castilla Leon. Please do join me for a very brief introduction to Bieso, as we've talked mostly about the introduction in this video. And then, of course, the, uh, the climate and grape growing specific to that area is next. Uh, part two, the next one, part three and four are only available on my e-learning portal. You'll see the address at the bottom of the slide. That's www winewithjimmy.com. Lots and lots and lots of exclusive video content there, plus lots of other little bits and bobs like resources, multiple choice questions, short written questions, map exercises, and all those things to help you with your understanding of your studies to, of course, gain the confidence of your examinations. Uh, any questions, comments, please pop that below this video, of course. But until next time, Thank you very much and see you on the other side. I've been Jimmy Smith. Ciao for now. Bye bye.